Are you a company looking for support in making digital content? Why not try GL Pro? GL Pro are a business based in London that help businesses like yours create content for the web, whether it's podcasts, video, or even websites. These guys are really good at what they do. For a free consultation, please contact GL Pro on www.glpro.co.uk forward slash Tiger Heart Chats. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Tiger Heart Chats. I am so happy to have you guys join us again. We've had a really good response following on from the first episode, which featured Stephanie Melodia. It's on all podcast channels, so download it, have a listen to it. But welcome to episode two. Today, I'm really, really, really excited to have someone, (laughs) a wonderful artist, a very progressive person, someone that I've met many a time. And I'm super, super, super happy to welcome Jasmine Bradicito. That's it. You're learning Italian as we go. So is that an Italian surname? It is. It is. My father's Italian. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Jasmine, it's an honor to have you on the show. If anyone's listening and they want to share anything while they're listening, please use the hashtag Tiger Heart Chats, all one word. Jasmine, please tell, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, good morning, Sanj, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to be asked to, to talk about the work. And it's quite synchronous today that uh, we're sort of doing this because it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Oh, yes, it is. And it is. And I just thought how wonderfully serendipitous that we were chatting today about the work that I'm doing. So where would you like me to begin, Sanj? Um, so I guess there's some people that don't know much about you. So it'd be really good to kind of get a brief idea about who you are as an artist in, in, the, in your current form. OK, so, oh, gosh, how, long story. As, as Steve Jobs said, it's all about joining of the dots. So, yeah, I very little. I was always very interested in drawing. Being an only child, I kind of spent many hours either reading books or copying from things. It's very nerdy, but that's the reality of it. Um, but... Uh, I was going to become a medical doctor. That didn't quite happen. And eventually I kind of went off and did physics and ended up at UCL. But the whole time that I was doing the science stuff, and this was at a time when science and art were not seen as common bedfellows. Uh, Now it seems very accepted, but at the time I very much did the art in secret. So I was going to life classes. I was sort of training myself how to draw won a couple of awards, which was amazing. And then I had the most brilliant tutor, I remember him well, at the Working Men's College, who just said, Jasmine, you need to go and study art. I remember saying to George, but I don't, I don't know anything about art. I don't know anything about the art world. And um, he wrote me a reference, and the, the long and the short of it, during the day, I was doing a PhD at UCL and at night studying art. And what was interesting is that, again, many people would think these two things are very separate. But I realized that I was a very visual thinker. I struggled with the mathematics enormously, but I could overcome some of that with visualizing things. I mean, now, if if I look at my thesis now, I go, oh, my goodness, who wrote that? There was obviously a time when I could. So this continued. And then I left UCL with this lovely, shiny PhD. I did research for a year. And strangely enough, it was all to do with color theory. I was working with Dulux. And... When I look back at my career now, I realize that everything was about light. Everything I've ever done is about light. But a little while after that, I set up a consultancy. And for 20 years, I don't really do it anymore now. We were delivering workshops and teacher training. And the whole time I was still making up. And um, then I had my son. I had my son very quickly. And it was important to me to be a very hands-on mom. So somehow or other, I had to combine going into schools, making the art, being a mum. And when Kieran was four and a half, I decided to go back to art college, sort of part time, purely because I didn't understand the language of art. It was very different to the language of science. Wow. Two years into doing this degree, still painting figuratively, still doing things that were quite traditional. You only need one person sometimes to change your direction. Um, and I had a brilliant tutor who said, why on earth are you, are you painting in this way? And I said, well, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, nothing is wrong with it, Jasmine, but 
you're not bringing in this enormous wealth of knowledge. And I remember, you know, I was a grown up, and I still remember saying, oh, my God, am I allowed to do that? And since one person gave me, and it literally changed my work overnight, I started building machines, I started accessing the physics that I'd been doing, and I found that I was combining these, these methodologies and also passing them on to my students. So for, yeah, certainly the last 10 years, everything I talk about in my public speaking is about this, this divergent thinking and how we combine things, because I'm a great believer that if we want to have a large paradigm shifting uh, stage in society, and let's face it, right now we really need it, it comes from little tiny acts of creativity every day. If you're one of these people who has to wear the same color socks every day, change it. Wear odd socks. And they would look at me quite strange. I go, well, the very act of doing that forces your brain to reroute, forces your yeah. brain to change. Yeah. And, um, and it worked. I know it worked. I've seen it. I've, I've spoken to tens of thousands of kids and adults and stuff. And not everyone has an existential change, but some do. Because it forces you to re-examine. It forces you to look at the world in a different way. It forces you to change your perspective. And it allows you to start to engage with things, to achieve a level of flow and, and mental health well-being, if nothing else. Amazing. And so with regards to you as an artist now, because I met you... Museum of London. Museum yes. Of London. And you, you did a presentation there for Maureen. Talk to us about where you are as an artist now and your relationship with Maureen and her umbrella of artists if that is, is that is that how you would kind of talk about it i guess it? you would or stable we would call it a stable of artists wouldn't we? yes <laughs> so <laughs> yes uh, i've been working with npr agency and marine for three years um because of course as an artist one of the things that's incredibly difficult to achieve is visibility for your work yeah. um and marine is a divergent thinker herself in the way that she handles the agency and and she, yes, last, last summer, we did a talk. And mine was, what was it, breathing, breathing art into environmental issues. Yeah. And so, again, it's, what's very, very strange is that I think, for me, I've been doing this a long time. And when I first started, the work that I made was very academic. It was very much coming from a place of conscious. And as the years have gone on, it's become very intuitive. So now when people say, why are you making what you're making? I say, I have no idea but I know that it will become obvious when I've made it. <laughs> yeah. And so as the years have gone on, so what, 10, 12 years ago, I started using discarded plastics. And this was before the story of you know, plastic pollution really took hold. But I remember the classic physics experiment and engineers use it as well. So if you want to design a bridge, for example, you wouldn't, you wouldn't start spending millions on the actual bridge. You would design it in plastic and look at the colors. With, with certain wavelengths of light and you'd be able to see whether the design was strong or not. And I remember that and I literally leapt out of bed one morning going, oh my God, that's painting with light. Why did I never see that? Because <laughs> normal painting, when you add layers of paint, you subtract light, things get darker. And, and I thought, well, you know, I love light. Let's start the other way around. So I started creating these. The very first piece was for Hove Museum and it was a, a show called Precious. It was taken to... Um, the refuse centers and I was digging about and skips and stuff, which I still do. <laughs> and uh, I created a, a color changing piece and that started the journey of plastics. And then about what, four or five years ago, I picked one up and started bending it. And I went, oh, this is sculpture, right? I've never really sculpted before. Um, so that started to take on a three dimensional form. But what was beautiful about this work was that it was taking something you imagine as rubbish and giving it a new life and showing that these things could be beautiful. And when I met Maureen, this was, <clears throat> excuse me, this was the work that I was making. The work was always inspired by either a connection to each other. And then about two and a half years ago, I can't remember exactly, create something for use in town. And at the time they were creating a well-being walk. So the idea was to get people off the Euston Road, which is one of the most polluted roads in the country, take people down greener, greener side roads, to interact with the local shops, the local community. So it was a whole program. And I created a piece. Oh, that was the thing. I thought, you know, mother is the, what is it? Uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I thought, well, I can't create a piece out of plastic for outside. It's simply not going to last. And where I am very fortunate is because I have such a large network of engineers and scientists and designers 
using a, a material they had sort of, they hadn't invented it, they had rediscovered it, if you like. They were investigating the transport to London as a sort of insulator and then a fire retardant. And quite by accident, as always the best things are, when they sent the material off for analysis, they realized that it had an amazing capacity to absorb NOx molecules from the air. And if you think of NOx molecules as tiny particulates that if they cross over, if you inhale them, they, they sort of, they're not, they're not good for respiratory problems. And there are millions of people in the world that drive, die prematurely because of the pollution that's in the air. Well, this, this material, I suddenly thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to try and create some art from it? And no one had done that before. So I've spent really the last two years um, in my own research and development, if you like, to create this, but it wouldn't have happened without that opportunity. So I'm very grateful to, to Marine and the agency. And as time has gone on, I've, I've started creating more pieces. I've got a piece going into the corner of the museum gardens very soon, the same material, because we now know that bees can't find flowers properly if there's too much knock. And so the idea is we've created this garden made of meadow flowers and grasses with the sculpture in the middle. Obviously, this material can't clean all of London air, <laughs> and it's not a solution to the pollution problems that we have. But one of the reasons I love working with something like this is to show that we do have the innovation, we do have solutions for things. And by creating art, it's, it's a way of visualizing it so that people can engage with it and so that they can become curious and understand a little bit more about bees and what they can plant in their garden and how they can help really with this sort of biodiversity problems and extinction. I don't know anything about this material, but through your choice to express your, you know, what's going through your mind through art using this material, you're able to communicate something. Well, I guess it, it initially it engage with someone, inspire them, get them to kind of think outside of the, the parameters of where their mind would normally lurk. Yes. And, and I guess this is why I do so much speaking on divergent thinking because I work with a lot of engineers. I've worked with, God, I work with product designers. And uh, I'm a great believer in play as well, the power of play, not just to reduce your cortisol levels and, uh, and your mental well-being, but to present a problem in a way that you simply couldn't have seen it before. And again, I think this is where creating with your hands, I call it thinking with hands. And uh, I remember some of the engineers that I work with, we do a, I do a, a class with a, with a colleague called Alessio, and it's for the engineering club. It, we call it, what does it call it? Creativity can change the world. And I will get the engineers to come in and they're sculpting with string and with plastic cups. And I can see that they're a little bemused to start off with. We've had some real existential change. I mean, one of the loveliest stories was one of the guys I work with. You know, I used to kind of resent going home to play with my kids when I've been working all day. But now when I go home and I play, I realize it's part of my practice and it will make me a better engineer. Wow. And, that, and that's lovely. And I've had lots of, you know, obviously not everyone is going to engage with it in that way. And I know that we're talking about art today, but I see creation as everything from the things that you pick to, to wear in the morning to the way that you make a sandwich. We all make these little creative decisions every day. And, and as I said at the beginning, we want to change the whole world. That's, that's the sort of shift that you need. Those little, little changes every day build up into medium-sized ones. And eventually, we can shift the whole way of thinking. That's a really beautiful, <laughs> beautiful statement. And I love it. And um, this is something that I found when, when you spoke at Create Futures 6, was that a lot of the thinking that you you kind of highlighted to the audience was how anyone could be an artist anyone could be creative and what I really found quite liberating was to hear that from you well, all, all of the art that you've done is just fantastic the stuff that you showed me it'd be really cool if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the pieces that you've worked on recently and what they mean okay so um, I now understand the narrative of, of why I make what I make environmentalism crept up in me and, um, and it, it wasn't something that I really intended to, to get into but I guess my father grows all his own food and uh, he does live in Italy and I remember one of the things whenever I would go and visit 
the second thing after having a proper cappuccino in Italy, which is the first thing I had planned, <laughs> was we would go home and he would introduce me to every plant that he'd grown. So I, and as I've got older, that's, that's become much more meaningful. And when I combine that with the fact that I talk about biomimicry a great deal, so if you think of the, the sculpture that I'm making for Horniman, I like to imagine that art is giving something back to nature because biomimicry is where nature gives us ideas after billions of years of evolutionary change. Um, animals and flora and fauna have solved an awful lot of the problems that we are facing. So we can, we can go and look at them. So a lot of my work has been about how the world is, is becoming, you know, Anthropocene. We are changing the very surface of it. Um, and that, you know, that, that's something that's happened, but we do need to kind of start appreciating that we need to, to keep hold of our biodiverse world, not purely because it's beautiful, but because we are interlinked with it. So the bodies of work have been anything from, at the moment, there's a series that's all to do with breathing. And I've just finished a short film called 700 Million. That was, that was inspired by my son, who four years ago, um, did have a proper asthma attack, which he never had before. So there is a series of work using the Noxtech material, which is about that. But I've also kind of been very inspired by this biomimicry. So the fact that the curve of a wave is very similar to the curl of a fish, fish fin to, you know, how a leaf will grow. And that's one of the things that's, that's inspiring me. And I'm kind of looking at the fact that the material I'm using is sustainably sourced. It's, it's a byproduct of quarrying. And I've been looking at using corn leaves as well because I wanted to get a particular effect, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't achieve it. Like, okay, where, where where will I find this in nature? And um, I remember being up late one night. And thought, oh yeah, corn. And I remember thinking of the corn leaves um, going to dads, and you can buy great big bags of dry corn leaves. So I've been starting to sculpt with those and use the material. So that's one series of work. And I also kind of um, go the very light and the very dark. So I've been making the beautiful breathing pieces, but just before, I think it was in October, I suddenly had an urgent need to make some pieces that were based on the apocalypse, if you like, and they are called Four Horsemen. But they're all based around air. And they were inspired very much by, I don't know if you've um, ever seen the big plague noses. You see them in Venice all over the place. I have, so yeah. Had, and that inspired kind of me using starting to use gas masks, which I was then casting, puffers, inhalers. And again, the Australian fires just before Christmas. I remember seeing a snippet of the news where there was an Australian firefighter who stopped for a moment to puff from his inhaler. And again, in terms of inhalers, we, we pretty much take them for granted. For some people, it's life or death. So that's a series of work. Amazing. And I'm assuming those pieces are documented on your website at the moment? Uh, some of them. Yes, most of them. I do need to. Yes, I think it is. I mean, because the series either goes through, uh, I've called it utopia, dystopia, biomimicry, so that you kind of see the work veering between sort of, you know, the light and the dark of this side. But yes, most of them um, are on there. Brilliant. Or they're on Instagram as well. I, I do post things regularly to Instagram as well. Brilliant. So you mentioned briefly about as an artist, sometimes it can be difficult to find visibility, be given a platform so that everyone can see the work that you do. Yeah. I'm sure there's a, there's, there's some artists listening to this. How, what are your, what's your kind of advice to an artist that's looking for visibility? I think again, as I said earlier, when I was first starting, I made things I could. And as I've continued making, I now realize that my responsibility is to make things that are really relevant to what's happening. So I think um, obviously finding a, a narrative here and then finding all the other platforms on which you can comment, whether it's not simply, you know, visual platforms. Um, but I did spend a long time on Twitter. And obviously I do quite a lot of public speaking. Mm. Um, with Instagram and, and social media platforms, they can take a great deal of time. So try and find your tribe. Um, because what's interesting with what's happening now, I've been talking about these things for a very long time. But because of what's happening in the outside world, people's sudden renewed appreciation for their natural world and each other 
what I'm talking about is becoming very relevant. So that's the other thing. I think you have to have patience. Yep. That sometimes your message is not ready to be heard. And this is why, as an artist, I think it's always important to make what you feel, what truly drives you. Don't, don't make what you think you should be making, you know, because it's fashion. You know, your own internal, internal narrative. And you have to hope that at some point society will catch up with it. We as a business, Tiger Heart, the technology that we build and the way we help our clients express themselves, that there needs to be a, a, an understanding that it is a form of art. It is an art form, technology. Mm-hmm. There is a tendency, with regards to a lot of the clients that we talk to, for them to want to be like something or like someone or to kind of engage with an audience that they've never engaged with before. And usually, when there's a contrived approach, the audience can see right through it and they're just not into it at all. And I think the key thing that you focused on right there was, uh, well, two key things. One is you do need patience because you've got to refine what it is that you're displaying. And then the last thing, which I really liked what you just said was um, just find your tribe, you know, because there is an audience for everyone. And that the audience that values you is the audience that you should focus on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And right now, it's it's the global tribe. We're all going through the same challenges. And um, one of the joys for me at the moment, and, you know, not to, what we're going through is very tough. And just like everyone else, when this first started, I think I had four days of complete existential sort of <laughs> angst and, and depression because I was grieving for a world that was changing. And wow. you do have to allow sadness. You know, I'm talking about positive well-being and that's important, but you do have to allow time for sadness. And any creative person knows that sometimes great work comes from a place of joy, but sometimes great work comes from, yeah, something that you're having to process and you don't really know what it is that you're trying to say. But I think trying to always stay authentic to what you're making is very important which is a struggle sometimes because obviously we all have to be living. I'm not yeah. saying that. So, so for me, I've found everything from you know, teaching to public speaking. But, you know, I am, I am an artist, but really I'm, I'm a bit of a dopamine junkie. This is what I always say to my students who get as high on ideas as I do. Because <laughs> then other people, they become enthused by your enthusiasm. And they go, well, what's, what's the secret? How can we? And, and that's how change happens as well. Yes. Um, uh, just because we all kind of the momentum grows, and that's you know, another thing that I'm finding quite wonderful at the moment. That the number of pictures I keep—it's funny. Instagram has become less about the celebrity at the moment, and more about people posting visions of their gardens, or the walks that they go on, or the way mm-hmm. that the city has changed, or the things that they're starting to grow or cook. That to me is is wonderful. That's changing. Yeah, the diet that that we have visually in a way that um, it's a a real positive. Absolutely. So uh, we've touched on it and I'd love it if we can focus on it for a bit. How is COVID-19 affecting how creative you are as an artist? And what are your thoughts about the current situation that's happening with the COVID-19 lockdown? It's funny I read an article the other day that was called the great pause and that's really stuck in my head because it is almost as if the planet is has just pressed pause and and you know I have two parents who are vulnerable obviously my son and asthma so I'm surrounded by vulnerable people I'm very aware of and I'm very aware of what's happening out in the world and I said as you you go through these stages of grieving, don't you? And then you come to the acceptance. How am I going to adapt? Um, so, yeah, so it was, again, it was it was this necessity being the mother of invention. So I thought, oh, God, how am I going to do this? And set up a camera remotely and started to do some demonstrations. What amazed me from this is the the, the response that I got. And I thought, oh, okay, then. Um, you know, these are some, I do some watercolours, I do some painting, and I've never, I haven't shared them for a long time. And I thought, maybe I should, maybe I should put these online, maybe people could get something from these. And again, people have been messaging me privately saying, what brushes do you use? What this do you use? So that, that's been, 
that's been really positive and, and rather lovely. And it's kind of reintroduced me to an old way of working that I hadn't done for a long time. Amazing. So, so, you're, the, you're, so you're creating new dialogues, new, new and exciting dialogues. Yeah, and it's it's been very it's been very humbling. I've had people say, "Oh God, I haven't picked up a brush for years." And and again, for me, one of the few times that you lose yourself is when you're really making something. But having to learn about remote sort of you know technology and, and setting up a time lapse and all of, all of this type of thing. But then on another note as well, I've also been collaborating with uh, an amazing bunch bunch of people called Public Art UK. And for years, they have been using drone technology. They've been going out around the country and capturing pieces of public art because they wanted to make them more um, so that everyone could access them. So you wouldn't have to travel halfway across the country. And I'm realizing now that whether you have filmed things, you have documented things, you can now share the outside world in a way that perhaps people wouldn't have paid attention to before because they simply can't access it themselves. And in fact, just before we were on, I was thinking this is a little bit like when the Industrial Revolution was happening and you had Turner and you had Constable and people didn't take photographs of landscapes, but we could, we could engage with them through great paintings. And so the visual films, uh, what people are creating, that's a way of people still accessing a world that they can't necessarily get into. And um, with, with public art as well, we've been looking at AR and VR, ways of taking the physical objects that I make and making them so that they are things that you can interact with. So this is really exciting for me because I was always a bit of a technophobe, probably because of fear <laughs> and lack of understanding. Uh, but the right collaborations kind of open your, your, you know, your, your mind to things and your eyes to things. And we're kind of looking at projection mapping and basically how can you, you can't, you can't go to exhibitions indoors anymore. So perhaps public art will be much more engaged with. So with the Horniman piece, for example, you know, we won't be able to open it properly, but it will be in the public parks. So people will be able to see it. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been an absolute revelation to me, to be honest. So uh, I shall be a technophobe no longer. <laughs> That's amazing. So this situation has allowed you to become uh, well. It's helped you to learn how to become more dynamic in the digital age. Yeah, because for example, I didn't really even know how to use Photoshop, and it was really frustrating me that every time I had to put uh, an image or something into, you know, another image, I couldn't do it. So I, I enrolled on a Photoshop course. I've been working through it gradually. I probably never would have done that otherwise. So it's about finding it's about finding little elements of control at a time when we don't have an awful lot. So you think, okay, what can I control in my local environment? What can I do? How can I? How can I present what I've made, but in different ways so that people can engage with them? And, and it's, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's just been a revelation, really. You've touched on your teachings. I don't do a huge amount of it anymore. Now I sort of, because the art has taken over, but uh, I literally teach on the Thursdays. I do, well, actually I do some other work throughout the year. It's at London South Bank University. I go in and I work with the engineers mostly or all of the engineers, and we work on divergent thinking techniques. Uh, because again, part of the, I remember as a scientist myself, you can, in fact, sometimes the more knowledgeable, knowledgeable you become, the more closed off you become. So um, I work with the students to try and open up their thinking. And I know it works because every year we've been finalists for something called Engineers Without Borders. Um, which is where they, they theoretically and practically to a certain extent take problems that are throughout the world and try and find solutions with the materials that those people have. So that's kind of working. On the 22nd of June, we've got a whole week of climate change and sustainability. It's a whole conference, online conference. Wow. And we'll be keynoting that and I'm helping them develop the visuals because, again, it's, it's quite scientific-based. And for me, if you can create beautiful visuals that are relevant, it will be it will be sort of uh, what's the word much more attainable for most people. So the, the mornings will be for students. I think I'm doing a demonstration one morning and then the afternoon will be for academics. Um, but I've got I've got I publicly spoke everywhere from the Institute of Physics to 
I can't, I can't, I can't even remember. It's been all over for the last few years. And um, this idea of thinking differently, it's gathering traction, which is, is, which is great. Because as I said before, I want everyone to be an ideas junkie, Sanj. <laughs> Whenever we work with a business that's interested in, you know, expressing their narratives using technology, the first thing we try to do is to inspire them and not think about the restraints of the technology and just really yeah. focus on what it is that they want to say and how they can say that. Yeah, I've learned that the hard way with, with making pieces of public art, which are a whole other level of complexity. You know, I was so worried when I first started about well, how will it stand up and how will it? And the wonderful engineers that I, I worked with, Solar Polar is, is one of the companies, they kind of said, Desmond, can you stop thinking about that? Just think about what it is you would like to make. Don't don't kind of put, put it in a box and we will figure out that. I'm like, okay. But it, it's that, it, it is, it's, and when you talk about narrative, it's like when people kind of say, you know, I want to build a website. And the website building bit is one thing, but it's the content that's difficult. And having kind of, you know, had it done a couple of times for myself, I know that building the narrative, the story, is the really, really difficult bit. Because invariably, we really don't know why we do what we do. You have to really sit down and think about it. And uh, that, yeah, but it, it's it's that that thinking bit, I think, is very, very important. Absolutely. And how did you feel about that when the engineers you were working with said to you, don't worry about what's happening behind the scenes, just focus on how you were going to express yourself? Uh, instant panic. <laughs> and, uh, and then going, do you know what? I'm not an engineer. Try and, you know, they are. Trust them. And I think this is this is the other a lovely thing about what's happening at the moment. Collaboration for me is everything. Collaboration and partnerships. Um, trust that other people will do what they say they're going to do, and and you just bring your bit to the table. And wonderful. I mean, I've, I've experienced it a few times now. Working with people who don't do what I do is where really good stuff happens. If you're surrounded by people who all think in the same way as you, you kind of, it's almost like you're in a little silo, in a little box. So, you know, if you think about what's happening in, in the world at the moment, it's only through collaboration of, of very different institutions, bodies, thinkers, that we will find our way out of it. And um, we're kind of seeing that at the moment as well. And also the trust in scientists. Um, having been a scientist myself and knowing about the empirical nature of things, you know, facts are facts. I'm, I'm loving the fact that people are suddenly appreciating again that, you know, you have to believe in what someone not have to. You should always question, you should always question. But, um, you know, science does have a very important place. And I think that had been lost for a little while. Myself, just like you, I love being surrounded by people that aren't in the same uh, mindset that I'm in. Um, yeah. Because it's only through collaboration that you can succeed um when you're just circling in a you know in a in an ocean full of the same people you can't really learn anything and you can't really uh help them to express themselves using the skill set that you have and vice versa um so it's so important but it's challenging sanj it is challenging because in fact the more expert you become at something the more difficult it is to kind of I don't find it difficult to say, actually, no, I don't understand. But I know an awful lot of people do find that difficult to kind of go back to square one, which is why I think so many people get very nervous about picking up a paintbrush for the first time. Absolutely. And, and I've seen it a million times with the people that I've worked with. They go, well, I'm not creative. I can't do this. And I go, can you just stop that, that mental narrative and mm. just play? Just, just mm. try it. And before you know it, they're away because they're playing and nobody's judging them. And that's where the good stuff comes from. We touched on talking about how some of the, the, the work that you do focuses on the problems of pollution in the air. Um, and you've been working with some materials. Do you want to focus on those for a bit? OK, so this, uh, this material is called Nox Tech. It's, uh, if you think of plastics, plastics are polymers that are carbon based, so they can change their shape. This material, which is naturally occurring, is also a polymer, and I always like to imagine it as an enormous giant plate of spaghetti <laughs> with all these strands which have lots and lots of holes and gaps in them. <laughs> and those holes and gaps are where the NOx molecules just sit. They just go and sit in them. 
What is amazing is the quantity that can actually be absorbed. So it's something like 15% by weight. So if one of the pieces I've made, which is uh, called Pestilence, it's a great big gas mask piece. It weighs about three kilos. Now that in an average sized room can clean the room for almost a lifetime, about 60 years. It's, uh, no, it's phenomenal. Um, and the science, you know, all the science has been done. And there is a wonderful little time lapse I have of, and I want to reproduce this experiment myself when the university is opened again. But it, you have sort of two bottles, one filled with NOx, which is that, that sort of brown, very brown, gassy material that you, you sometimes see, obviously, when, when we have um, sunsets and things, you can see it sitting in the air. And, and the other bottle, so they both got it in, one's got a bit of the material and one hasn't, and it clears very, very quickly, depending on, on you just see the colour clear. So that's a very kind of, you know, strong visual representation of what it's doing. Um, if you then, I mean, I'm making pieces for inside, but with outside, what happens is the knock sits there and when it rains, it will wash away. Um, it, it is a very, very weak sort of acid. It goes into the ground. And I know Michael who was one of the developers of the material. He's even planted it in, in his allotment to, to see, you know, what it would do. So it's, it's an incredible material, but it's, it's not the entire, obviously, solution to anything. But it does, it can clear the air of NOx. And, um, but it's kind of, as I say, I mean, it was, discovered, it was discovered about 40 years ago by a professor called Professor Dovodovich. Oh, I said it properly. And he... <laughs> One of his theories were that the pyramids were not cut, the, the blocks weren't cut. His theory was that they were cast in situ from a material very similar to this. And I think, again, for a long time, no one really listened to what he had to say. And now, of course, his work is gathering traction. So, yeah, there are all sorts of these materials that, that can be used in, in other types of ways. But it's, it's, um, it's not an easy material to use. And trying to create something that's fluid out of it, because obviously Alcatec are sort of doing engineering solutions and stuff, has been very, very challenging. <laughs> and I realise that's something that I tend to do all the time. I kind of go, right, what would happen if we do this? Uh, very often when I get questions from kids and they kind of go, how do you know that you were going to end up being a scientist and an artist? I go, I spent my whole life going, what would happen if we do this? And that's exactly what I do. I will see something. I go, I wonder what that is. What would happen if I did this with it? And that's exactly what I've been doing with the Knox Tech. So it's taking on a life of its own. And um, because of the large piece, I then, oh, this is the other technology thing. I then kind of thought, well, how do I scale this down? How do I scale this up? How do I reproduce this? And then I kind of, last year, I really went down the route of scanning, 3D printing, molding, I was teaching myself how to do all of this with, with the aid of the universities. London South Bank University has been brilliant in helping me, as have Public Art UK. So I now realise that through things like 3D printing, which are much more sustainable ways of creating things, you know, it's an additive manufacturing form, I can take some of the shapes that I've made before and manipulate them and do other things with them. Um, sorry, yes, I've gone off a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> no, that's fine. Like tangent away, you know, we're, we're all in lockdown. We want to listen to ideas. So yeah, just go for it. But no, it's, and so, you know, I also spoke to somebody who was at UK Concrete and I'm interested in, I'm interested in finding out about 3D printing of ceramics. If anyone knows anything about that out there, um, how instead of kind of starting with this material and trying to manipulate it, is there a way that we could 3D print it as well? Amazing. So that's, that's a bit of a call out. <laughs> how were you introduced to Noxtech? This, um, one of the companies that I work with, well, their friends, Solar Polar, an amazing company that have actually invented uh, completely solar powered air conditioning. Um, it was it was it was one of them. It was Dr. Robert Edwards who said, "Oh, you should speak to Michael. They've been working on this material." So it was just through honestly, it was through serendipity and just conversation, Sanj. And I went, to, I went to speak to them. I said, "Has anyone ever made art out of this?" And they said, "Well, no." And I said, "Well, will you let me? And I will try and drive more awareness to what you're doing, more awareness to your material." And this has been so exciting because you know very often people don't think that they need art. 
And you think actually art can drive your awareness to, to not just beautiful objects that might make you stand and look for a moment, but to what they're made of and how they're made. So this is what's very exciting. For me, this is the, you know, when I talk about collaboration and I talk about STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, art, and maths, this to me is a beautiful marriage of all of them. And, um, and that's why I get so excited about it. So I guess we've got we've got two more questions before we close this podcast. This has been an amazing podcast, and I think you know we should we should definitely have you on the show again because you oh, have so much you, to say. Oh, thank you, because I don't <laughs> know what I've been saying, so it'll be interesting. To <laughs> Mate, it sounds good. incredible. It sounds incredible, and I'm so I'm so proud to have you on it. The next question: How is tech coming to the aid of artists who can no longer exhibit in person? Okay, so. You can see it happening all over. So, for example, I noticed, I can't remember which museum it was, but they put a, a call out to people to reproduce classical paintings in their homes. And the photographs have been amazing. So an awful lot of the museums now are developing virtual online exhibitions. Uh, I know the Tate is doing it. Um, just most, most of the global sort of museums are starting to do that. So, you know, exhibitions that you can wander around. Somebody was telling me yesterday that I think in Hastings at the moment, they have a little robot in one of the galleries and you can book time on the robot so that you can manipulate it so that it will walk around the gallery and look That's at awesome. the things that you want to look at. I mean, how cool is that? That is awesome. It's so interesting that you talk about this because particularly the VR space has been promising that type of experience to consumers for years. Like I think since like 2013 or 2014, and it's only through this pandemic that those types of platforms are starting to solidify and become useful. Yes. Yeah. But I think, again, it's this necessity thing. So, yeah. So this idea of virtual, virtual exhibitions, um, certainly I know that the agency is looking into all sorts of VR and AR experiences, because again, you know, you could, you can create an R, an AR filter, for example, that you can push over your interior um, so that things look, look differently. So all of a sudden your phone can, can become almost like a lens that you look at the world through differently. Um, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Oh, and, but I guess with all all artists at the moment, they're being forced to look at their work in in a slightly different way. Um, sorry, Sanj, I'm losing I'm losing my whatnot at the moment. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. But yeah, it's. Um, to, I guess it's it's as I said earlier, it's we looked at paintings to be able to experience the outside world. Now we can experience the outside world through the screens on our phones and our laptops. And um, and the other thing that, oh God, this is the really other exciting thing is the number of online courses that you can engage in and the number of people that are offering tutorials and, and um, all sorts of classes. There are life classes now that you can, you can, you know, add to, you can get in on a Zoom life class so that you can sit there drawing someone. So I think, it, and it, it allows people to be brave from, from, you know, the comfort of their own living room, whereas a lot of people perhaps may not have gone drawing otherwise. Uh, and, oh, yes, and then the other major, the major thing, one of the reasons I started painting again is Alexander McQueen, who I love. I went to see Savage Beauty three times. I thought the man was a genius sculptor, but just in fabric. Uh, not just in fabric, you know what I mean. It's my favourite fashion uh, design of all time. Oh, man, but they have been running a thing called McQueen Creators every week. And every week they set a challenge. And the first week, I think it was the rose dress. I was really, it was lovely when they 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 picked one of my, my paintings and kind of shared it. That was great. But it's getting people, the first week was painting. I think the second week was sculpting and making. This week or last week, it was printmaking. And people have been really engaging with it. And I'm sure there are other, you know, probably other brands that are doing similar. I'm just not, not aware of all of them. But yeah, through McQueen, they're getting people to be creative and that's share awesome. their creations online, which is great. That's absolutely awesome. And I think that's the key piece of optimism I've heard um, over this era is it's forcing people to become brave, you know, from the comfort of their living room, which is such a beautiful quote. Thank you. That's all right. No, actually, I had thought you're quite right because we can do that within the, within the comfort of our own homes. Because as I keep saying with painting, no one has to see what you make; just do it for because you want to do it. Yeah. And when you look at one of the reasons I love watercolor, Sanj, so much is it to let go of control. 
that's one of the things that's so joyful about watercolor. If you try and control it, it looks contrived. If you allow the water and the pigment and the paper to, to move and do their own thing, you can come up with some most beautiful, spontaneous work. And that, I guess, is... It's, again, it's it's a real metaphor for where we're at at the moment. We can't, we can't. There's so much that we can't control, but there are small elements, you know, in our everyday life that we can. And if we can all come out of this with, and not everyone has to. That's the other thing, you know. We don't all have to be learning new skills. I think just being able to survive at the moment every day, that's good enough as well. Um, it, it, but it is, it is a great big pause of of some description, and my hope. My real hope um, is that when we come out of this, we don't forget about how blue the sky has been. We don't forget about how wonderful the air has been to breathe. And we do try and use this, this mobilization. Because when you see the mobilization around COVID, it's been amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you would have thought that people would literally stop still. All the cars would be off. No way you would have thought that could have happened so quickly. Mm. So if we can do it, COVID, I'm really hoping that we can do it for our environment, you know, after all of this. Jasmine, this has been incredible. <laughs> has all, it been all right? Really? It's been amazing. No, seriously, seriously, it's been really cool. I'm so happy we got you on. If people want to get in contact with you, how, how should they contact you? What's the best way? Just to email me, really. Either go through the website, which is www.pradicito. That's P as Papa Romeo Alpha Delta, India, Sierra, Sierra, India, Tango, Tango, Oscar. <laughs> and the reason I had to learn that was because of my surname. Or they can email me purely at jasmine at pradesito.com. And I would love, I love hearing from people. It gives me great joy when people kind of go, I tried this or I tried that, or I have an idea. So it would be, you know, um, idea junkies all together. Fantastic. So it'd be lovely to hear from people, Sand. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Uh, and guys, for all those that are listening at the moment, thank you so much for your time. I hope you guys are safe and sound. And we'll have another podcast in the next few weeks, which will be episode three. If you've enjoyed this one, I'm sure you'll enjoy the next one. And Sam, Jasmine, Sam you got just before we go, just, I wanted yeah. to thank you. Thank you for uh, listening to me and, and interviewing me. And I also, <laughs> want to, I also want to reiterate what you've just said. Please, everyone, be safe and um, take care of yourselves. And thank you very much, Sans, for having me. No worries. Thanks for inspiring us. Really appreciate it. <laughs>